Thank you very much. Uh, these are my disclosures, uh, and uh, I've been sponsored to come to the meeting by Allergan. So I'd like to present to you uh, the long-term data of clinically meaningful improvements in urinary incontinence following long-term onobotulinum toxinate treatment in patients with overactive bladder syndrome, a final results of the three and a half year study. Sorry. So just some background, uh, there were two phase three randomized controlled trials that showed the treatment with onobotulinum toxin A, 100 units improves urinary incontinence and quality of life in patients with OAB. This analysis I'm gonna to present today looks at the long-term safety and effectiveness data from the extension study of these two trials. So once the patients completed the two 24-week randomized trials, they were eligible to enter a long-term study where they received 100 units or 150 units. Approximately halfway through the trial, it was found that 150 units didn't really provide with any further improvements, so a protocol was uh, created uh, and only 100 units was used thereafter. The last patient completed the study on August 2014. So a total of 829 patients entered the long-term extension study and requested treatment as, uh, retreatment as needed. This analysis focuses on those patients who received only a 100-unit dose throughout the study. And in order to evaluate the consistency of response after repeated treatments in the same groups of patients, effectiveness data were assessed in mutually exclusive subgroups according to the total number of onobotulinum toxin A 100 unit treatments received. So they received exactly one, two, three, four, five, or six treatments. There were a total of 502 patients that entered that. Adverse events were also assessed for the 100 unit dose for all the patients enrolled, not the 502 alone. You can see here that there was a clearly consistent reductions in urinary incontinence episodes per day at week 12, regardless of the total number of treatments. So patients that received exactly one, two, three, et cetera, all the way up to six, they had a consistent reduction in urinary incontinence episodes throughout multiple treatments. When we look at proportion of patients with a reduction in urinary incontinence episodes, there was a consistent proportion uh, reduction in 50% and 100% reduction in urinary incontinence episodes per day. If you look at the light purple, you can see that that's a 100% reduction in urinary incontinence consistent through the, the six treatments. And similarly, both bars, the light purple and the dark purple, is 50% reduction at least, again, very consistent results throughout multiple treatments. The overall median duration of effect, time to request treatment was about 7.6 months. Interestingly, if you look at this, 65% of people had more than a six month response rate. Pretty impressive, actually. Now, the concern is that if you have repeated injections over multiple, multiple injections, are you going to get an increased rate of uh, adverse events? This was really not seen. Urinary tract infection, which is the most common, uh, actually did not increase. It stayed about the same or maybe even a little bit less as time went on after repeated injections. And keep in mind, this is for the full number of patients that received 100 units, not those the mutually exclusive groups. Similarly, with retention quite low and did not increase in number, clean intermittent catheterization, again, a concern, did not increase in number. So there were no new signals as time went on after repeated injections. So in conclusion, patients with overactive bladder and urinary incontinence treated with onobotulinum toxin A up to three and a half years showed consistent reductions in daily urinary incontinence, daily urinary incontinence. and the overall median duration effect was about 7.6 months and there were no new safety signals identified upon repeat treatment with onobotulinum toxin A. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Comments? Yes. Thanks very much for a really interesting study. You showed the uh, duration of effect uh, under six months and greater than six months, but that was for all the group. But within an individual subjects. Did you find a variation? In other words, was that... Was yeah, there is a variation, and uh, obviously we don't have time to show everything, but there are some patients that only require uh, less injections for various reasons. Not necessarily they've had a perfect response. They may not want another injection. They were busy, summer vacation. So not all the patients ended up having every 12 weeks injection. So it's quite variable. But generally, if you look at all the patients, 65% uh, of them had greater than six months response, felt that they were adequately treated. Yes. I, I thought that was going to be my, sorry, Ralph Webb from Norwich. And what about the efficacy within the individuals? In, uh, how much variance was there? Because anecdotally... Well, we presented, 
the, right. the data we presented are those patients that were received exactly one treatment, exactly two treatments, exactly three treatments, and it was consistent. So those that even up to six treatment, and we have data up to seven and 13 treatments, it, the numbers are small, it's virtually the same. Patients but, consistently have a great response. Because, well, I was thinking anecdotally, I, I and I know others have had a treatment failure in an individual patient that, that you give the same dose the same way and patients come back say it hasn't done as well as I expected. So I wondered if you had any data on that. I don't have the data on that. We actually were discussing that about last week on that regarding we, we should probably look into that exactly because exactly as you say, I have people that respond and then don't respond. Right. Okay. Thank you. So uh, you, you presented consistent efficacy. Uh, why did only 50% uh, uh, finish with the three and a half year study? That's interesting, and that's the same question everyone always asks us. So there's a couple caveats. One is it's a long study, and if you look at a lot of the OAB trials that are long standing, you know the rates of people persisting are about 50%. But if you actually look at why people drop out, about 5% dropped out due to adverse events. And of that 5%, a half a percent due to actually treatment failure or treatment issues due to adverse events. The other 5.7% or 5% drop out because of a lack of effectiveness. There were other reasons. People don't like to be on a trial for three and a half years. They get pregnant, they get bored. There's protocol violations. So that's the main reason. But basically, for treatment failure or adverse events, only 10%. And did they, those patients had uh, a bridging between in, um, when their symptoms came back before the next injection or they were completely without treatment? Well, every 12 weeks, the patients uh, were el eligible to receive treatment, but they had to meet certain criteria. For example, uh, two, greater than two incontinence episodes over a period of time, three-day diary, uh, no retention, and, and requested the treatment. So, I mean, did they had antimuscarinics in between just before uh, the next treatment for bridging the time? Uh, they were not supposed to during okay. the study. They, that was one of the criteria. Oh, okay. It's a quick question. I know in the original papers um, by Victor Nidia and Chris Chappell, they looked at antibodies. So I was just curious to know, in the follow-up study, did you guys check for antibodies and things like that as well? I didn't present that, but there is, uh, we discussed that uh, recently in our uh, manuscript presentation, the antibiotics were quite low. And interestingly, if I'm not mistaken, some patients that actually develop antibodies still have a good response. It's interesting. So yes, we looked at that as low, but even the people that actually develop antibodies still have a good response. Interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you.